I don't know if you noticed this recently, uh, but there are these juice places popping up all over the place, right? $10 green juices. I like green juices. I'd actually pay $10, though I try and get it, make them at home. And, you know, the thing that's kind of credited with starting the kind of green juice, the juicing phenomenon in this country was a documentary called Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead. How many of you guys have seen that documentary? You can watch it on Netflix if you haven't. There was a guy named Joe, and he was very overweight and suffering with this kind of different ailments. And he decided what would happen if he just got healthy. And he went on, I think it was a 60-day juice fast, lost a bunch of weight. His sickness went away. And he goes across America. It's funny. He meets all different people, you know, people that love their ribs and their cheeseburgers and all that sort of stuff. And he begins sharing what he's doing. And he winds up helping this truck driver who had a similar disease and kind of helped began to change uh, his life. And just amazing story how he lost like all this weight and started to teach other people about juicing. And then recently I noticed Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead number two came out on Netflix. <laughs> So I couldn't resist. So I'm watching the movie, and in it, the, the guy, I forget his, what was his name, Larry, the truck driver, whatever his name was, uh, I forget his name, but he winds up, he's, he, he, he winds up connecting back with Joe, and he's so ashamed because like people Facebook him every day and saying, I was so inspired by how you made a decision to get into shape and to get into health. And he doesn't want to let, he kind of was hiding the fact that he kind of gained all his weight back and kind of went back to the place that he was. And, and when you watch the movie, you know, one of the things he said is that one of the reasons he said, he said it just, he just, he was, he got so lonely and felt he had no one there for him. And then uh, they had this doctor come on and he said, you know what? He said, the, he said, yes, people talk about this uh, eating epidemic here in the United States and the problem we're having with food and with weight. He said, but the, really the issue isn't so much a social problem, it's a connection problem. And that most of the time that people who have unhealthy lifestyles is not because they want to be unhealthy, but it's because they feel alone. And they feel isolated. And this is what we talked about last week, that one of the first things we saw in creation is God says, Lo Tov, it's not good for man to be alone. And that aloneness preceded the fall. And one of the things that God wants to do is take away our aloneness and we have to understand that we live in a world that is becoming increasingly broken, increasingly fragmented, and this means that we live in a world that's full of a lot of hurting people that need love and need care. There's a lot going on. And it's our responsibility to come alongside them, begin to minister to them and love them in a meaningful way. And we talked about this last week. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested the Lord, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Yeshua, Jesus, said to him, What is written in the Torah? What is your reading of it? He answered and said, You shall love what? Soul and strength and your... Neighbor as yourself, and Jesus said, you've answered rightly, do this and you will live. So love is the key to living. But he wanting to justify himself went away, went and justify himself, asked, so who is my neighbor? It's funny, every night since my kids have been old enough to speak, before they go to bed, the, the, the way we begin prayer is by reciting these words from Deuteronomy 6, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. V'yahavta et Adonai Elhecha, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. V'yahavta l'reacha kamocha, you will love your family and your friends like yourself. This is the foundation of what we just read of the great commandments. And one night, Avi, my oldest son, said, Dad, what's more important? To love God or to love your friends and family? And being a good dad and rabbi, you always have to answer a question with a question. <laughs> 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 
So what's, what do you think, Avi? What do you think is more important? He thought about it for a moment, pondered it seriously. And he said, well, Dad, I said, he said, I, I, we're called, to, I said, you've taught me we're called to love people and not things. So I guess to love people is to love God. He got it right. I was very proud, proud dad. You know, the truth of the matter is to really love God, we have to love other people. You know, John 1, 1 John 4.20 says this, Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sisters whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. How can we say we love the one we have not seen if we can't love the one who is sitting right in front of us or right next to us? You can't have hate and love in your heart at the same time. It's like the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? God doesn't want our tree to be mixed. You know, a good tree produces good fruit. You can't have hate in your heart and bring forth the fruit of love in your life. It, it just can't, it just doesn't happen. And the way we practically demonstrate love for people is by caring for them. I'll never forget early when I started to, uh, to early on doing ministry and I was having a rough time. I was coming up about knocking heads with some people. And I was like, God, why are these people making my life so difficult? I just think I want to quit. And the Lord spoke to me so clearly. He brought me to John 21, and he, said to, and, and he showed me the passage where, where Jesus is reinstating Peter, and it says, if you love me. And, I, and it says, and I felt the Lord say to me, it doesn't say if my sheep are nice to you, love them. If my sheep appreciate you, love them. If people encourage you, love them and serve them. No, it says, if you love me, care for my sheep. And I realized that on that day is that sometimes sheep bite. <laughs> the hand that feeds them. Sometimes our kids do it, our friends do it, our family do it. And I realize, though, my motivation for loving people is the fact that I love him. If that's not my motivation, my love for him, then there can be sometimes an unhealthy neediness that comes in and I'm loving people because I want something from them. And that's, you know, normal on some level, but it's not the type of love that God wants us to love with. And so then he, the man says, what? You know, trying to justify himself, he asks this question, who's my neighbor? Who do I really have to love? And you know the famous story that he tells? He tells the parable of the good Samaritan. There's this man walking on the road and, and he's robbed and beaten and left for dead. And there are these three men, two religious guys, a priest and a and, and a, a Levite, and they just walk right on by, leaving him dead. And then a third man, a Samaritan, who Jews and Samaritans go get along, he's the one who stops and takes care of him and brings him to an inn and makes sure he's taken care of. And Yeshua says, Jesus says, the, the one who loves like God loves, the one who takes time to provide loving care for your neighbor, that's the one who is the good neighbor. That's what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. So a key part of transformation is not just loving, it's not just learning, but it's also caring. We cannot transform the world, we cannot transform other people unless we are willing to care. And part of caring is seeing the hurt, it's seeing the aloneness that is not good in the life of other people that needs to be removed, and it's like, you know what, I'm going to step in and help to remove the aloneness. Let me tell you, the man in the parable of the Good Samaritan, you can't get any more alone than dead, almost dead, beaten, stripped, naked, robbed, and lying on the side of the road. Talk about feeling alone. You know, I'll never forget. There's so many great things that I love about ministry. My favorite being encouraging people and praying for people and sharing. 
But sometimes you get those tragedies. And we had a friend in North Carolina who, this woman was from an Israeli Jewish background, had an abusive husband. It was just a nightmare of a situation. We tried to walk her through. And they got back together, and, and, and they had a child, and the child was born very sick and was in the NICU and didn't look like the child was going to live. And it was a really tough situation. And we were there just praying and comforting the family. And we walk out of the hospital that day, and I walk out the front door. I remember it vividly. I walk out the front door, and there's this, there's this older woman, and she's sobbing. And just all these people are just walking by her. Like she's not even there. People are just doing their business, doing their thing. And this woman is crying. Uh, she's leaning against kind of like a, a column. And I just saw her and my heart broke for her. And I went up to her and I said, ma'am, is, are you all right? Is there something that I can do for you? And she's like, well, my son, he's got cancer. And the doctors say he's not, he's not going to live. And he's my only son. I'm, I'm all alone apart from him. And I'm like, can I just pray for you? And I prayed for her. And I gave her a hug. And she said, are you a minister? Are you? I told her about She's like, you know what? She's like, I've been standing here. And just I've seen all sorts of religious people walking by. And they didn't even stop. But you stopped. She goes, you don't know how much that means for me. She goes, even the, even the, even the, even the, 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 the pastor who came to visit the, the, the chaplain, he's like, he just came in, but there was no comfort. But I, I just feel comforted. Thank you so much. And I got at that point, like that story of the Good Samaritan. It's like when we see people alone, when we see people in pain. How can we just walk on by? And the reality is so many of those people were just so busy, they didn't even see her. They didn't even, or some people are like, well, you know, I don't know her, so I'm just going to mind my business. No sense of responsibility. They didn't see or they didn't care. And the reality is, is how Many times do we sometimes do the same. She needed someone to comfort her. And God wants to use us to bring comfort and care to your neighbors. In fact, it's comfort and care that begins to remove the hurts and feelings of aloneness that we sometimes feel. Think about it. In the garden, Adam sinned. But even in the midst of judgment, even after the midst of what God pronounced, what does God do? He says that he clothed them because they were naked, right? They felt ashamed. They felt guilty. But what did God do? He did a divine makeover. He came along and he dressed them up and he removed their shame and, he's, and he provided care and comfort for them by clothing them. And we need to know that as believers, we need to learn to love and care for one another, if there's one thing I want us to be known for here, I want to be known for in my life, and what I want to be known for in a sense, I want to be known that this is a community where people can be cared for, that caring is foundational to living and modeling great commandment love, to love the Lord and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And this means developing as, one of, as, as, as a great commandment heart that recognizes the hurt and pains of others and identifies the unhealed hurts and seeks to meet unmet needs. It's kind of like a, 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 a rabbi had a number of disciples and his disciples came to him and he said, Rabbi, I love you so much. And he's like, no, you don't. He's like, I do anything for you. He goes, that's really nice, but you don't love me. He said, what do you mean I don't love you? He said, can you tell me one thing that hurts me? Friends, we can't say we love someone until we know what hurts them. We can't say we love someone unless we know it brings them joy. 
If we really care about someone, we're going to understand who they are as a person and we're going to know how to, to love them and to meet their emotional needs and speak into their lives and be there for them in a way that they can understand and receive. And that's what I love about Jesus. Jesus, when God becomes human flesh, what does he do? He steps into our world. He steps into our situation and circumstances and he gets down on our level. I love it when Patrice and Leah were here and I'm so influenced by their time and Mary. She said one of the things that they love about when the woman is condemned by adultery and he gets down on the ground and he starts writing. You know, one of the things I said is that I, I said, I think one of the reasons why he got down is that he wanted to get down on her level. Like everyone was just kind of standing over her, pointing the finger. But he gets down right there in the dirt. He gets right down there in the mud with her, gets down on her level. And if we really want to care for people, we got to go where they're at. We got to get on their level. We got to make them feel we're not above them, but we're right there next to them. And we can't effectively care for and comfort someone if we don't understand their pains. And one of the primary ways we remove hurt is through comfort. And I think learning how to bring comfort to the hurting is a lost art. It's a tool that many of us don't possess. But let me tell you, when someone is hurting, we're going to talk about this more in a minute, they don't need some sort of spiritualized solution to their problem. Right? Sometimes what they need for you to do is just put your arm around them and love them. There's certain you listen, there's certain pains in a person's life that no words that you could ever share will ever take away their pain. And in some ways you might you might even like hurt them or insult them or trivialize their pain, right? Job's friends were okay until they opened their mouths <laughs> and try to try to explain. Job, let's figure out all the reasons why you might have gone through this. Let's look at your life and find out every possible thing you might have done wrong to for this to happen to you. That's just not helpful. It's not helpful. It's like you go to a house of mourning, in a Jewish house of mourning, you don't say hello, you don't say goodbye, because you don't put that burden on the person. You're there for one person, and that's, you're there for one reason at the house of mourning, to comfort the person that's received loss. Listen to what 2 Corinthians first, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 3, and 4. 2 Corinthians 1, I love this verse, chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Blessed be the God of our Father, the Lord Yeshua the Messiah, Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation, that we might be able to comfort those who are in any trouble, with the comfort which which we ourselves are comforted by God. So God is the so God is the God of all comfort. He comforts us in our trials and our tribulations for what person, for what reason, what purpose so that we can comfort others who are going through the exact same thing with the comfort we receive from God. Let me read you another translation from the uh, what a wonderful God we have. He is the Father of the Lord Jesus, the source of every mercy, and the one who so wonderfully comforts and strengthens us in our hardships and trials. And why does he do this? So that when others are troubled, needing our sympathy and, cur and encouragement, we can pass on to them this same help and comfort that God has given us. God is the God of all comfort, Part of what it means to be made in his image and likeliness is that we imitate the actions of God, the actions of Messiah. If he's a comforter, guess what we're called to be? And guess what? He's put in us the Holy Spirit 
Okay, John, John 14, 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So how does he not leave us comfortless? comfortless? John 14, 26, but the comforter, the counselor, the helper, the intercessor, the Holy Spirit, whom my Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will cause you to recall everything that I have told you. So one of the names of the Holy Spirit, one of the names of the person of the Godhead is the what? Comforter. If the Spirit of God is the Comforter and he has placed the Spirit of God in us, then we have access to comfort and the ability to supernaturally comfort. That's how he's the God of all comfort in part. And one of the things Comforter means is one to run to our, one who runs to our side and picks us up. A friend is someone who runs in when everyone is running out. So the Holy Spirit runs to our side. God runs to our side. That's why it says two are better than one because one falls and the other is there to what? Pick them up. Comfort is picking the other person up. It's running to their side when they've been knocked down. Man, friends, it's kind of like, how many times have we been knocked down and there's not been someone there to pick us up and it's kind of like, hey, you just got to pick yourself up by your bootstraps and get up. It's not how we're designed. We're there to pick each other up. Two are better than one. Relationship, not to be alone. The Spirit is in us and He's the Spirit of comfort and practically what it means to do the, the work of the Spirit. Yeah, it's great if we can give prophetic words and heal the sick and, and do this great stuff, but that's awesome. But let's not forget the foundational stuff. His name, the Spirit's name is not miracle. It's not supernatural. It's comfort. There's something supernatural about bringing comfort. It's part of what it means to partner with God and do the work of the Spirit. You know, there's so many on our ministry team that are great at bringing comfort, that God is giving that ability to, to just love on people and, and pray for them and, and speak that over them. You've got to have a desire to bring some comfort if you're a counselor. I know... You know, many of you have that ability. It's what, one of the things I love about Shifra. She, she bring that comfort. You know, I mean, right? That spirit of counseling. <laughs> you know, and, and, and I'm praying that the Lord would bring the spirit of comfort when the Seahawks beat the Patriots. You're going to need some comfort. <laughs> I've got no, I got no, I got, I got no horse in the race. I would have been rooted for the Packers because my wife's family are big cheese heads, but that's another story. It ain't easy being cheesy. In fact, when I got married, they gave me a cheese head. I won't go there. Anyway, we had to comfort her family this week. It was a rough week for them. But friends, there's three. On the most basic level, there's three basic steps to bringing care and comfort. It's kind of like the, when you're in school, they taught you when there's a fire, stop, drop, and roll. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that's earthquakes out here or something. But the first thing is stop. Just simple, stop. Stop what you're doing. Stop the busyness. Stop being distracted. The problem with the good Samaritan versus the ones who didn't is they just didn't stop. They just kept going and doing their thing. We can't walk by like the religious leaders walked by. We can't say we love if we're willing to leave people lying in their pain and keep going on with our busy lives. Got to stop. You know, I, I've shared this before, but I love it. You know, I just, how many of you guys know who Stan Lee is, the famous uh, creator of DC Comics? Marvel. Marvel, sorry, Marvel, excuse me, heresy, excuse me. They picked up stones to stone me. 
I was just, uh, he has a, they have, there's a new reality show. Well, it's an old reality show. Well, I guess it's a new reality show that was just released. But uh, he finds people with superhuman strengths, which is cool. There's actually a samurai who could cut a baseball in half at 86 miles an hour. But the crazier thing, yeah, this is just an aside. He, his, the guy shot a BB gun at him, and he cut the BB in half with his sword. Yeah. Crazy. It's not humanly possible. But a short while ago, he had a six-week reality show entitled, Who Wants to Be a Superhero? They did a nationwide search stating that any ordinary folks who have never lost their inner desire to be a superhero, and people tried out to the show, they came decked out in their best superhero capes, utility belts, weapons, and the field was narrowed down to 12 wannabe superheroes, actually 11 because one was a traitor. And uh, he was the bad, he wasn't really a superhero, he's meant. So the 11 remaining were reduced to 10 when superhero levity was eliminated for greedy motives unbecoming of a superhero. A show with morals. But the next challenge caught my attention. There was a superhero refresher course. And anyone who's familiar with Superman knows that he was Clark Kent by day. And when something happened, he ran to the, to the, to the booth, to the phone booth, and ripped off his clothes. And, and then got on a superhero outfit and went and helped. So the, the, this t task was that when you, when you got the call to go for help, you had to rip off your clothes, put on your superhero costume, and run as fast as you could to the designated point. So everyone did it. But along the way for running to the designated point, there was something interesting. There was a little child that was placed there who was crying that they were lost and that they were scared. And pretty much all the superheroes ran by and their desire to win the challenge they ran by the little child who was screaming for its mothers. And this one superhero stopped, picked up the little child, and ran with them to the finish line, <laughs> knowing that it would jeopardize the time and possible elimination. And he explained to them, so when they finished, Stan Lee explained to them, he said, the challenge was not about the fastest runner or who could change the quickest. It was about those who had the hearts of superheroes selflessly giving of themselves and risking their own wants and need. He said, the heart of a true superhero puts his or, own, his or her own goals aside to show love and compassion to others. That's the good Samaritan. The person who was a superhero was the one who was willing to stop. And potentially be eliminated. Stop, number one. Number two, look. How many times do we see, but we don't look? We see, but we don't really see. And we have to learn to see the people that are standing in front of us, both emotionally and spiritually. And third, to listen. To actively listen, to hear what's going on in the life of the other person. And four is empathy. What is empathy about? It's about identifying with the pain of the other person. It's Romans 12, 15. Romans 12, 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice. And what? Weep, weep with those who weep. Friends, we need to mourn with those who mourn. I mean, this is what Messiah did when he stepped in to our world. Think about it for a moment. He was a man who was familiar with sorrows, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was the greater than Moses. When Moses, God appeared to Moses in the burning bush, it wasn't just any bush. It was a thorn bush. Why? Because God was identifying with the pain of the people. He says, I've seen your suffering. I've seen the thorniness of your situation. And Jesus identifies with us, and he wears the crown of thorns on his head because he says, I feel you. I empathize with you. I care about you. I mourn with you. 
I understand and feel your sense of pain, and we have to do the same and understand people's sense of loss at some level. And even when we can't fully comprehend it, it can come from a place of real care for the other person. There was a very successful couple, and they lost their, they lost their son. And everyone was coming to their house to wish their condolences and saying all sorts of things. You know, somehow God works it all out together for good or, you know, he's in a better place. And they weren't comforted. They were actually agitated by it. They were disturbed by it. And their spiritual, their, their rabbi walked in and he put his arms around them and all, he didn't say a word all he did was cry with them. Sometimes there are no words. Sometimes all you can do is just cry with the person. You can just feel their pain and you can just comfort them through identifying with what it is that they're going through. Care, comfort, compassions, are keys to seeing the healing process really begin in someone's life. If we can't minister comfort, we're not going to be really to help people through their difficulties. Like my parents loved listening to doo-wop when I was growing up and oldies but goodies, right? And there's that song, big boys, they don't cry, yeah, yeah. They don't cry, big boy. <laughs> right, we have this belief, right? Real men don't cry. I'm a real man. I'm not going to cry. It's nonsense. There was no one more manly than Jesus. Right? He's a carpenter, for goodness sake. He's the most perfect guy to ever lived. And he, he hears about his good friend, Lazarus, who's sick and who's died. And what does he do? Does he run there? No, he waits four days to make sure he's good and dead. Why? Because he knows he's going to do a miracle and he's going to raise him from the dead to, to demonstrate that God is with him and God's love for us and his ability to, to even overcome death, not just disease, but even death, the culmination of disease. And he goes there and he sees Martha. He sees Mary. They come to him and they said, if we, if they said we, we know if you would have been here, this wouldn't have happened. What does he do? The shortest verse in the Bible, he what? He wept. Friends, he knew he was going to raise them from the dead. That's why he waited. And yet, even though he knew the story was going to have a happy ending, at that moment, he saw his friends hurting and broken, and he wept. He wept with them. He didn't say, oh, I'm sorry, I was tied up. You know, the demands of ministry, busy schedule, a lot of people pulling on me. Sorry. Don't worry, I've got this hand. He wept with them. He felt their pain on a real level. And we need to do the same. It's just like he's standing there and he's looking over Jerusalem and he knows that the leaders of Jerusalem are going to reject him. They're going to put him on a cross. They're going to mock him. They're going to, you know, and people, the crowds are going to jeer at him. And instead of being upset and say like, hey, wait till you get what's coming to you. Because God's going to destroy the house of God because you're not really the type of people that God wants. What does he do? He looks over Jerusalem and he what? He weeps over the destruction of what's to come. Because he cares. We read, we read this week about the parting of the Red Sea and bringing Israel through the Red Sea. And the Egyptians go in and God drowns the Egyptians in the Red Sea. And the, there's, a, there's a midrash that the rabbi teaches that as the angels, as the, as the Egyptians were drowning, the angels in heaven were singing because of God's great deliverance. And the rabbis say this in the story, that God said to the angels, my children are drowning in the Red Sea. How can you be singing? So here are the Egyptians, persecute, traffic people, hundreds of years, don't change their heart. God has to bring judgment. 
throw babies into the sea to be eaten by crocodiles. And God says, these are my children. How can you sing when my kids are drowning? Be quiet. So we spill wine at the Passover Seder three times, different occasions, because we can't rejoice in other people's suffering. Do we have that sort of care? Like, if we saw someone who had really done something harsh to us and mean to us, if we saw them going through a hard, hard time, we'd be like, yeah, man. That's what I'm talking about. Lord, teach him that lesson. Or would we be broken for them? If God's ministry of comfort, God's ministry of comfort, that brings blessing at the point of mourning. The great Sermon on the Mount, blessed are those who what? Mourn, for they will be what? Comforted. God is near the brokenhearted. And when we learn to mourn with and comfort others that are mourning, it does three things. Greater intimacy is established. Man, you really get me. You really understand me. You really care about me. You're there with me. I'm not, you know. Number two, it takes away aloneness. Because everyone we in pain, we feel like we're alone. And number three, it releases blessing. So caring in part is about comforting. We need to make it a priority. We need to give comfort, but here's the reality too. Not only are we called to give it, we have to be willing to what? So let's be honest. Sometimes there's people that want to comfort us but we don't want to receive it or they don't even know we need comfort because, you know, it's because we don't allow others into our life to know it or to do it for us because we're scared to be vulnerable and admit that we feel hurting and alone because we feel that if we, we feel we can't reveal our hurts and aloneness because we're scared, but if you can't reveal your hurts and aloneness, your loneliness, You'll never have intimacy if you can't admit it. So we have to fight the urge to be self-reliant because too often times we're just like, you know what, I'm going to man up and handle this pain by myself. We feel like these lies, like, man, I don't want to burden other people with my problems. I don't want to look weak. So we come up with excuses to push our pain down. But we can only push it down for but so long. And our self-reliance, one of the things it does is that, that it denies my neediness. So we said last week, every one of us is needy. We deny our neediness when we become self-reliant. And we say, you know what? All, I can handle it all myself. I got this covered. If I do have a need, I've got it covered. I'll take care of it myself. I'll make it happen. You can't make it happen. You can't take care of it yourself. And self-sufficiency is a form of idolatry, which is an aspect of pride. If we think we can handle it on our own, there's an idolatry that's rooted in pride in our life, and we have to put away those idols. Self-sufficiency, like self-reliance, is one of the most dangerous forms of self-idolatry that, that kills relationships. You know, it's kind of like they say the heart, sometimes heart attack is the silent killer. Self-reliance is the silent killer because we suffer alone, not wanting anybody else to know about it. And we... We, 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 we rob ourselves the health and the healing we need. We rob the community of the, of, of the opportunity to minister to our needs. And then we don't embody the great commandment love that God commands us to. And, but you know, what the self, you know what the antidote to self-sufficiency is? It's humility. Because part of humility is what? Receiving. Part of humility is saying, I need your help. Sometimes we just think, it says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. We have to be humble before God saying, God, I can't handle this on my own. I need your help. Then we need to ask other people as well because God wants to use them to be our help. We have to humble ourselves. 
being willing to receive, right? The greatest thing in the world is learning how to love, but also how to be what? Loved in return. So even being loved is an aspect of humility. Receiving is about humility. And I got I, I to gotta be honest with you. Sometimes I struggle with that. I'm a guy, number one. But number two, you know, like I chose a, a profession where like I, I live to help people. And so sometimes I don't want to like have to tell other people I might need help. Right? Because it's my responsibility is to help you. My con- and I care about people, so I want to help people. But sometimes it's hard for me, if I'm being honest, to say, you know what, I need help. Talk about myself and what's going on in my life. Not because I'm scared to open up, but I don't want to burden other people. I've got to sometimes put that false thinking out of my head. But we do have to be wise with who we open up to. Ministering comfort demonstrates the love of God, brings healing, helps us to experience greater connection, intimacy with God and with others. You know, it's like learning how to comfort our kids. And, and like this week, Avi was, I love Avi, and Avi was like had this spelling test and he didn't do well last week because he didn't realize he had to prepare for certain words. And like Avi's strong and he's like wants to do everything perfect and he wants to win and, you know, and he, he was getting upset because he wasn't getting all his words right the first time. And I had to come alongside him and comfort him and, and encourage him that he could do it. And he got a 9 out of 10 and he was happy. Right? I didn't get up. Like, at first I wanted to get upset because he's like, I don't want to do these words. I'll never do them. I'll never be good at spelling. I'm just going to quit. But I stuck in there with them, talk with them, Avi, we're not quitters, we, you're going to do hard work and the right attitude and God's with you and all that. <laughs> Took a little bit more than that. <laughs> Promise of some gems for Clash of Clans didn't hurt. <laughs> got to do what you got to do. Um, that one time. <laughs> Another occasion, Judah, <laughs> Judah broke my iPad one time. He shouldn't have had it. And I just, and I honestly, like, I was so upset. It was Friday night. I didn't have my iPad. I, 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 don't, I don't know what to do with I don't preach. I mean, I have to print out notes and speak from notes. Oh, this is like, I can't do that anymore. <laughs> Not one of my finer moments. He was so scared to tell me. He's like, oh, my goodness, I can't tell Dad. He's going to be so upset. But you know what? I've got to learn to comfort. We've got to learn to show grace. Jesus identify with our suffering and our pain, and we have to learn to receive. And one of the things that I'm concerned about that I see in the body of Messiah is I'm concerned that increasingly more so where the church for many years was passive, we become very power orientated. Right, God's going to give us the power and we're going to take back all the mountains and we're going to triumph and we're going to have the victory and we're taking Hollywood and, you know, you know, we're conquerors every place that our foot treads and we're going to conquer ground. And look, I, I, be, look I'm not, I believe that on some level. I believe that on some level. I believe in him we're more than conquerors. That's a promise. I, I believe that. But, but there's a danger when we become so power orientated, so like we got this victory orientated, so triumphalistic that we forget that there is a balance when Paul says, I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings and the power of his resurrection. Right? There's two aspects. Messiah is the lamb and he's the lion. The lion will lay down with the lamb one day. The two aspects of Messiah will come together. But he had to become the lamb first before he could fulfill his role as the lion. His first coming was as the lamb, the second as the lion. And I'm concerned we identify so much as the lion and the victory and the power that we minimize people's pains and sufferings and struggles. And we're just like, man, you should have the spirit of God and overcome everything. So don't even talk to me about your struggles. You just don't, you know, you have to have faith. Don't speak that negative word out there. Don't, don't speak. And, you know, we forget. And I think it's dangerous. 
Because the, we have to identify with the hurting and the broken to mourn and to feel pain, not to minimize it, not to try and give it some quick fix by quoting some Bible verse and, and doing a deliverance prayer and say, go in Jesus' name, you're healed. Right? We're called to sometimes really carry people's brokenness with them. Don't try and this craziness of like, it's just, it's just you know, just let's not take it seriously. There's a brokenness and humility that we have to carry. Jesus was a healer. He's a wounded healer. He still has the holes in his arms. He still has it in his side. He still has the scars. If you only have power, you're... If all you focus on is the power side, you'll never be able to heal. His power is perfected in weakness. Healing comes through suffering. He died that we might have life. And you can only bring, a, bring real healing to people if you've suffered some pain and if you're willing to walk through some pain with them. So some people seem so powerful, so strong, so stoic, so confident, so, pull of, so full of power and self-confidence that they don't even seem approachable, that they don't even seem to have any hurts and oftentimes these are the spiritual leaders that are on the big platforms and tv stage life is perfect everything is good and 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 we feel like i could never be like that it's not real sometimes life sucks but god will show up in the midst of it and he'll bring something out of it the pain and rejection precede the power And so many times people fall into hopelessness and can't find real healing because because, because they don't, they they, they just, they've been wounded and they're just like, man, and they see this other stuff and they're just like, you know, I don't have any hope. That could never be me. And then we get to this point where we're like, man, we just shouldn't expect too much from God. And that's a lie too. And if all we know is the lamb will be lame, the suffering, the rejections, the We won't be able to help others. We'll have an anemic faith. But if all we know is the lion, we're going to bulldoze people. So the lion is power and victory, encouragement, supernatural healing. He rose. He overcame. He wants to do for us. Don't settle for a form of godliness that repower. Settle for a godliness that form of godliness that lacks power. But sometime in our conquering spirit, we bring condemnation to the hurting because we don't get it. But we're called to be wounded healers. Wholeness comes out of brokenness. A humble healer to bring healing and comfort. So just some practical things here, and we'll, we'll finish up. Responses that don't help when you're trying to comfort someone. Don't try and be a fixer. The first thing you want to do is try and fix people when they're broken. You want to fix their pain. Okay, I know what's wrong with you. Let me tell you and give you three steps and you'll be fine. Not helpful as the first connection. So what's the response? Listen to the pain. Identify with it. Number two, don't go into teacher mode. Let me tell you everything you should learn from this situation. So you don't do it again or so it doesn't happen or why it happened. Be careful not to be a motivator. Right? And the person's in pain and all you want to do is be the cheerleader. Woo, woo. I'm going to inspire you out of your pain. Let me get my pom-poms. Just focus on the positive. Don't focus on the pain. Let me tell you, when people are hurting, they need to know that you feel their pain. Then you have the avoider. Let's just change the subject. It's not helpful either. So as, so as when, when Mary and Lee were here, they gave us this very helpful, uh, Patrice, this very helpful sheet on what does comfort look like. Really connecting with the pain of the other person, hearing their story, asking questions. Man, really hear, really listen, engage, get, understand. It means expressing comfort with loving words 
And with actions, give someone a hug. Hold someone's hand, appropriate touch. Just want to <laughs> clarify that. No sloppy agape. It means showing understanding, empathy, and gentleness. What does it sound like? Things like, you know what? I can really see that you're hurting. Really see that you're hurting. I can understand why that was so painful for you. It saddens me that you're hurting. I'm committed to walking with you through this. Someone's calling (laughs) because they care. What can I do to help you? What can I do to help you? I know you're hurting, man. I am so sorry that you had to go through that. It hurts my heart for you. Man, I just, I feel that. I feel that, you know. And part of the way, and I got to tell you, part of the reason why we can't do that, part of the things we need to do, I've known, Paul's right, I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings and the power of his resurrection I'm sure every one of us has prayed for more power. But how many of us have prayed, God, help me to understand your suffering. Help me to, I mean, first thing we got to understand is how could I comfort Jesus if I'd been there, right? I mean, they can't even stay up with him for a few hours to pray in the garden, Every one of them rejects him as he's hanging there on the tree. Where his, where his 12 mighty men? Where are they? Only one is to be found. Agony on that cross. God, I want to know what you went through. Lord, I want to know what you have felt, and I want to know what you experienced. I want to enter into that, and I want to have some level of understanding what you did for me. To understand that and to know that, that's the basis for being able to bring comfort to others. There's a story that I love of this rabbi and he dies, and his son prays. And his, his, before he dies, his father, his dad says, "I'm gonna." The rabbi says, "I'm gonna come and visit you." And it, you know, he, his son makes him promise to come visit him in a dream to let him know that he was all right and to give him some sign that he was all right. And many days go by, many weeks go by, and he doesn't. And so he goes to he goes to his dad's best friend, who was another holy rabbi, and he says. Have you heard anything from my dad? Have you gotten any signs that he's okay or what's going on? And the rabbi says, I prayed and God gave me this vision in heaven. He goes, I went to heaven and I was searching all the different places. I went to Abraham's house and David's house and I couldn't find him. And I finally met someone. I said, we'll tell you where he is, but you have to go through this long, dark forest and you'll find him on the other side. And so he goes through this long, dark forest, and he hears something in the distance. And there he sees his friend standing by the ocean, leaning on a stick, on a stick. And he says, he says what are you doing? And, he's, and he turns to him, and he says, do you know what this is? And he says, what is this? He hears this. He never heard waves like this. And he said, this is the sea of tears. This is where God stores every pain of every person in the world. He stores all this pain in this sea. And he said, I promised, I swore to the Lord that I would not leave this place until he wipes away every tear. When I met that woman on that day in the hospital and I saw her standing there, I remembered that story that I had heard when I was younger. And I realized that I couldn't go until I wiped away her tears. Friends, if we wiped away each other's tears, if we mourn for those who mourn, worship team come up, mourn for those who mourn, man, 
the sense of loneliness, the sense of community, the sense of connection, how would that be changed? How would our life be changed, right? We'd have real community where we could really open up and we don't have to walk in on Sunday morning and pretend like we got it all together because we don't have it all together. No matter how good you might look, you don't got it all together. And so I just want to right now, I just, I say this, it's just a simple message today, but it's a heartfelt message. I want us to be that sort of people, to care. It's so simple, but it's so hard to do. And so I just want to, I just want to right now, I'm just asking if you have been going through a painful or difficult experience right now, you don't have to say what it is. I just want to invite you to stand. If you're going through a painful or difficult experience right now, I want to invite you to stand. And friends, if you're not standing, get around someone who's standing. And we're going to worship for a moment, and we're going to give them a hug. And, and we're going we're gonna to just hug them, and we're just going to comfort them. And we're just going to say, hey, is there anything that we can do for you? any way that we can pray for you. So just take a moment right now to the person around you and just ask them. Just give them a hug first of all. Ask them if you can give them a hug. (laughs) 